Amish Second Loves. Copyright 2015 by Samantha Price. All rights reserved. Chapter 1. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm chapter 16 verse 11. For the past three weeks Moira had been dealing with intense bouts of morning sickness. After a particularly bad bout of sickness, Selma overheard her moans and brought her a cup of warm tea with vinegar in it. Selma promised Moira that the drink would settle her stomach, and to Moira's surprise it had worked. Moira's stomach still felt comfortable, so she decided to make the breakfast to give Selma a break. Moira heard Selma in the spare bedroom humming to herself, so she slipped past her bedroom and hurried into the kitchen. Moira was happy that her young toddler, Millie, had taken to sleeping in until mid-morning. Millie had been named after Selma's late sister and Moira's good friend. As the house filled with the aroma of meat and eggs, Moira heard the sound of wheels scraping against the dirt outside. She hurried to the kitchen window and peered out to see old Michael Stutzman coming down the driveway in his buggy. The horse slowly clip-clopped his way up the beaten path before Mr. Stutzman's buggy came to a halt. Moira tried to make sense of why Mr. Stutzman would be visiting them that morning. He wasn't someone known for showing up unexpectedly. It was odd to see him there. Just then a voice called from behind Moira, breaking her concentration. What's all that noise? She turned around to see Tom scratching his forehead. What's going on out there? I thought you'd left for work hours ago, Moira said to her husband. I was doing some repairs to the wagon out in the barn. I was just about to go and repair a fence. Moira turned away from Tom and peered back out the window. We have a visitor. Michael Stutzman has just pulled in. I was cooking some breakfast, I'll set an extra place. Have you eaten? Moira felt a little guilty that she hadn't gotten up early to prepare breakfast for Tom, but he'd insisted that she stay in bed while she wasn't feeling well. I've eaten but I can always eat again. Tom grinned. Strange that Michael's here. Do you think it has something to do with Selma? Tom asked. I don't know. Why don't you go and bring him inside and then we might find out? Moira said. Who might be here for me? Selma asked, seemingly emerging from nowhere. Moira whipped her head back around to see Selma while Tom slipped away. You startled me, Moira said. I wasn't speaking to you. Someone's in the yard. Oh, Selma replied. Who is it though, she asked, running over to the front door. Selma pulled the door open, and Moira put down her spatula and chased the older woman out of the house. Selma, what are you doing? Nothing, she replied. She looked outside, and after she saw who the visitor was, she turned to Moira. I just want Michael to know that I'm back in town for a while. Selma stared at Mr. Stutzman. Moira's mouth fell open as her eyebrows drooped. Moira pointed to the porch chair and Selma sat down. Act normal, Moira said. You're acting like a child on the eve of a special day. Moira looked around for Tom, who was nowhere to be seen, and then she watched Mr. Stutzman as he tied his horse to the post. Mr. Stutzman glanced over at the two ladies and gave a little wave before turning his attention back to his horse. Wait. Stay here, Selma hissed at Moira before running down the steps toward their visitor. Caught off guard by Selma's orders, Moira plopped back onto the porch chair and then leaned back. She watched carefully and listened into Selma and Michael's conversation. Mr. Stutzman smiled broadly at Selma as she approached and Moira shook her head in disbelief. Hello there. Mr. Stutzman said to Selma after clasping both her hands in his. I'd heard that you might be back in town, and I was hoping the rumors were true. Moira couldn't see his face clearly due to Selma's head getting in the way, but from what she could tell, Mr. Stutzman looked mighty pleased to see Selma again. As confused thoughts raced through her mind, Moira tried once again to make sense of Mr. Stutzman's visit. She knew that he'd met Selma a few times, and she also knew that Selma was looking for a husband. Did the older couple already spark a flame that nobody else had noticed? After he released her hands, Mr. Stutzman and Selma wandered off. Moira realized she should have been quicker to mention that breakfast was nearly ready, but she was more interested in hearing what they had to say to each other. Moira followed them, staying as close to them as she could without being noticed. All she could hear was a question that Mr. Stutzman asked Selma, which she was certain was, would you perhaps be available at all tomorrow? For what? Moira mumbled to herself, 
making sure to be quiet enough not to bring attention to her murmurs. I figured we might be able to spend the day together, or however much time you can afford. We can do anything you'd like if you just say yes, Moira heard Mr. Stutzman say. Moira listened for Selma's reply, but it would never come. All she heard was the annoying sound of the older woman's laugh as she giggled like a young girl. Moira sighed aloud and shook her head in disapproval. It was more than obvious that Selma and Michael Stutzman were keen on each other. The look on their faces was enough to confirm the truth of the situation. She must have agreed to see him tomorrow. The couple turned back around to walk to the house. Mr. Stutzman looked up and saw her. Moira, how are you? I'm good. This is a nice surprise. Please have breakfast with us. Moira asked. I'd love to stay for breakfast. He looked around and then pushed his hat slightly back on his head. Is Tom around? Yeah. Moira swiveled her head to find him. Well, he was here a minute ago and said he was going to greet you, and now he's gone. Maybe he's in the house somewhere. Mr. Stutzman followed Moira into the house with Selma close by his side. Tom suddenly appeared from somewhere within the house. Tom, where did you get to? Moira snapped at her husband giving him a frown of disapproval. I wasn't too far away. He looked at Mr. Stutzman. Good morning, Michael. Morning, Tom. Moira and I haven't had a chance to have a good talk to you in some time. We've been meaning to have you to dinner, Tom said. Mr. Stutzman rubbed the stubble on his chin. Ah, yeah, it's been a while, but work on the farm can be relentless and unforgiving, as I'm sure you know very well. Moira smiled, nodded, and pointed to the table. Breakfast. They sat down, and then Selma and Moira hurried to place the food from the kitchen onto the center of the table. After they said their silent prayers of thanks for the food, Selma was the first to speak. You've heard of Tom and Moira's news? They're steadily filling up this large house, Selma said to Michael. Mr. Stutzman said, Yeah, I heard that you're expecting again, congratulations. Thank you, Moira said. And where is little Millie? Mr. Stutzman asked of the couple's young daughter. Asleep, Selma said. But not for long. She's got so much energy, she's like a tornado. Moira gave a little giggle. We do enjoy the quiet when she sleeps late. I hope you don't mind me stopping by. I'd heard that Selma was visiting again, and thought I might find a moment to steal her away from you. Certainly, Tom said. You hardly need to ask our permission to do that. Mr. Stutzman smiled. Good. Selma has already agreed to spend some time with me tomorrow. So is that all that brings you here today? Moira asked, knowing that was the only reason Michael had for visiting. I think we need coffee. Selma jumped up and disappeared around the corner into the kitchen. Ah oh, well, uh, I, he stuttered, pulling at the top of his shirt as if it were choking him. I just had a few things to check on for some people, he said. I'm happy for both of you. You must both be excited about adding to your family. Moira could tell that his words at that moment were entirely honest. The joy in his eyes and the brightness of his smile showed just how pleased he was for her and Tom. Why thank you, that means so much to us, she replied. Mr. Stutzman looked toward the kitchen where Selma was now bustling around fixing coffee. He leaned in toward Moira and spoke quietly. You know, it's been nearly three years since I lost my wife, and not a day goes by that I don't miss having her by my side. It gets a little easier every day, but there's a loneliness in my heart that eats away at me. His vivid blue eyes fixed on Moira and then Tom. Mr. Stutzman turned back to Moira and asked, Could I ask you a question and get your honest response? Reluctant to say yes for what it might give way to, Moira looked down and spoke softly, Yeah. Then why do you look away when I ask? Mr. Stutzman shot the question back at her. Looking up at him, Moira shook her head and sighed. I was just thinking about Mrs. Stutzman and how much I miss her, she said. But you can ask me anything. Go ahead. Do you consider it a crime for a man to long for affection after his first love has left this earth? Seconds passed by as thoughts sped through Moira's mind while Tom and Michael stared at her waiting for an answer. Was Michael confirming her suspicions about liking Selma or was he speaking in general terms? Either way, Moira wasn't sure how to reply, but she thought of the late Anna Stutzman and Michael's five boys who were now grown men. I really don't know how to answer that, Michael. 
If something were to happen to me long down the road, I would want Tom to be happy again, but at the same time I would want him to do what is right for his family. It's what they think, which would be the important thing. No, the only thing that would matter to me. Mr. Stutzman continued, that's where the dilemma starts. How does a man know what is right for his family? Could his happiness possibly be a bad thing to his children? Selma cleared her throat as she came back with the coffee. Moira looked at Selma and knew from the frown on her face that she'd heard some of their conversation and felt awkward. After Selma placed the coffee on the table, she said, maybe we need tea as well. Selma hurried back to the stove. Chapter 2 Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm chapter 23 verse 6 Knowing she had to speak quickly before Selma came back with the tea, Moira continued the conversation, Michael I think happiness is a fickle thing. What might make you feel good right now might be the death of you later, she said, hoping to get her point across. Their words were interrupted by Selma bringing the tea. Tom, could you get the milk? It's standing near the stove, Selma asked. Certainly, Tom said, jumping to his feet. Placing the tea down, Selma said, I'm so sorry if it took me an eternity. This all looks wonderful, Tom said as he sat the milk on the table. How's the farm been, Tom? Mr. Stutzman asked. It's been going well, but a hole was spotted along the fence on the far end of the property, so that's just one of many fixes I need to get done today. I'm heading out there now to mend that one spot, but I was also thinking about riding around the perimeter to check for more," Tom explained. Mr. Stutzman leaned forward and asked, Would you like some help? Moira noticed a sullen look on Selma's face. Just then, however, Tom's response quickly replaced Selma's sour look with one more pleasant. Thank you, but I can handle it, it's not a big job. It might keep me busy for a few hours, and I don't want to hold you up for something so easy to fix. A short while and a few mouthfuls of food later, Tom asked, I hope you all don't mind if I leave now. I'm already behind where I wanted to be by now. Please yourself, Moira said. What a hard-working fellow, Mr. Stutzman said as he sat back in his chair after Tom left. Moira watched as Mr. Stutzman and Selma exchanged glances. Not long after that, she noticed that a loving stare sat locked between the two. Not wanting to see such things with Anna Stutzman's loss still fresh in her heart, Moira decided to leave them alone. I think I heard Millie wake up. I'll go and see to her. Selma sprang to her feet. I'll go, Moira. You sit and rest. Nonsense, you stay here and entertain Michael. I might even lay down for a time. I should probably get going anyway, Mr. Stutzman replied, standing up from his chair. No, Moira replied, you can stay as long as you wish. Finish up the tea, she added, looking directly at Selma. Selma smiled at her and Moira forced a smile at Mr. Stutzman before she disappeared up the stairs. While she didn't care to see their affections right in front of her, she was anxious to know what was developing between them. Moira peeked in at Millie, who was still fast asleep. Moira went to her own bedroom and lay down on her bed. She noticed that she could hear the voices of Selma and Mr. Stutzman. They must have decided to take their tea out to the porch, she thought. Moira's bedroom was positioned directly above the porch. Moira wasn't quite sure what she might overhear, but her heart had to find out if they were seriously interested in one another. Why does he get to be happy? Is he ready to replace Anna already? It didn't seem fair to Moira. It was as though Anna Stutzman had never existed. Moira listened hard and heard Mr. Stutzman say to Selma, You never actually got the chance to tell me about your late husband. Then Selma's voice invaded Moira's ears as she spilled her story to the man on the porch. It's been a long difficult road since I lost my dearest Bob. He was taken away much too young, and was never truly given the chance to shine the way I knew he would have. We never even had an opportunity to start a family and have a child, which was something I've always regretted. That's why I love helping Moira with Millie, and I'm so blessed that she's having another little one for me to love and care for. Moira felt a pang of guilt over begrudging a possible relationship between the pair, but she shrugged it off just as quickly. Selma had a sad story, and she'd become a close friend of Moira's, but that didn't take away from anything that Moira believed to be proper. She thought about Mr. Stutzman's boys, and how they would react when they found out their father was fond of Selma. 
Would the Stutzman boys blame Moira for bringing Selma into their community? After all, she was the one who introduced the pair. If it weren't for her connection with Selma's late sister Millie, then Selma would have never come to Earl Town. Moira listened again to hear what else they might have to say. I thoroughly understand, Moira heard Mr. Stutzman reply to Selma. If I didn't have my five boys and my grandchildren, I don't know if or how I would have dealt with my dear Frey's passing. I miss her every single day, and it's not just that I feel lonely all the time, sometimes I miss simple things about her, such as her smile and her loving personality. The only thing that makes me feel peace is when I tell myself that she's at home with the Lord and she's happy. His words hit Moira hard, and she remembered the happy Mrs. Stutzman and a time when life wasn't so dreary and unforgiving. Her youth was filled with joyful days of her sister Hazel and herself having fun with Anna as they sewed quilts nearly every single day. No one could replace Anna in Moira's heart. Tears stung behind Moira's eyes and she blinked rapidly to force them away. Just then, Selma's voice rose up through Moira's open window. I know it's difficult but as I've had to learn, it gets easier with time. Moira shook her head and clenched her teeth. No, time wouldn't make losing someone like Mrs. Stutzman easier. And even if it could get easier, Moira wasn't sure that she wanted it to. She never wanted to forget how much she loved and the amazing Anna Stutzman. Moira's thoughts drifted to her oldest sister Miriam, who was married to Mr. Stutzman's oldest son Adam. Moira wondered if Miriam had heard anything of the attraction between her father-in-law and Selma. What a nightmare that would be, she whispered to herself, rolling over and burying her face in her quilt. Selma stared at Mr. Stutzman, the corners of her lips each reaching for her earlobes. He looked back at her intently, his eyes filling her with a sense of warmth which she found comforting. He tilted his head and smiled broadly, and Selma could tell from the look in his eyes that he absolutely adored her. She'd never been looked at like that before. So, about tomorrow, would you be interested in going somewhere with me? I can take you over my land and show you the sights. It isn't anything out of this world but it's a beauty to behold that is for sure, he said. Selma's stomach churned as it reacted to the question before her mind had a chance to form a response. She looked at Mr. Stutzman and nodded, of course I'll go with you. I would absolutely love that. I thought I said yes before. Mr. Stutzman's chuckled and his face lighted up. Do you know how long you'll be staying in town? I should be around for a good while, but I might have to make a quick trip home in a couple of weeks or so. My nephew Jeremiah is in charge of looking after my late sister's cats, and that is a chore he's not very fond of. Selma laughed. I can't blame him though. At least he's been kind enough to watch them whenever I go away. And I suppose I should stop referring to them as my late sister's cats, they're my cats now. Changes like that take time, Mr. Stutzman said. Have you thought about bringing the cats with you next time? As much as Selma wished that were possible, she knew that it wasn't. Unfortunately, I can't. You see, one of the cats is not like the others. Fang is a hot-tempered little thing and doesn't get along with the other cats. That's why Moira decided to take him to live with her, away from the other cats. You're saying if you brought them here they would fight with Fang? Selma pushed her lips out and nodded. I'm sure something could be done to remedy such a situation. How did the cats all get along when Millie was alive, he asked. You would probably have to ask her that question, Selma said, a hint of laughter trying to escape her lips. But even if we could keep them separated or something, I wouldn't want to subject the cats to the long two-day journey all the way here and have them put up with Fang when they got here. Mr. Stutzman frowned and turned away, shaking his head. I'm sorry, I understand now. I just don't know if I want to see you leave so soon, especially if it means I might not see you again for some time, he explained. Selma smiled, her heart warming on hearing his words. Well, have you ever considered traveling to Colson County? I know it's far from here, but you could stay at Bishop John's house. He lives at the halfway point. And when you get there, you can stay at my brother's house. He lives very close to me. I think it would be the next best thing to me coming back. What do you think? Um, Mr. Stutzman said, looking back at her. I'll have to come up with a good excuse to give the boys, but I think that sounds a good idea. Your brother won't be opposed to the idea. I mean, I would be more than happy to help out with work on his property in return for his hospitality. I just don't want to stir up any problems. 
I fear that I'll have plenty of those already once word gets out about the two of us. Selma sighed, looking down at her hands as they sat folded in her lap. Well, I think we're going to have to brace for that inevitable happening, but for the time being, perhaps our energy is better spent elsewhere. My brother will welcome you with open arms, and if you feel so strong about working with him, I'm certain he wouldn't turn your offer away. Selma chortled. Mr. Stutzman stared at her and then his lips turned upward. He nodded slowly and reached his hand toward hers. Touching her softly with the gentlest care, he looked into her eyes and spoke. I think that would be a trip worth taking. We might have to keep in touch when you go back to Colson County so we can plan it out. I would love to visit you. He placed both his hands around hers. The other option is that you don't go back there at all, you stay here with me. At that moment, the world stood still for Selma. She couldn't help feeling like she was drifting toward the clouds as her heartbeat quickened. She hadn't felt such a sensation since Bob had passed away, and even though it scared her somewhat, it was a feeling that she knew she'd missed. Selma smiled up at Michael. You want to keep me here? Yeah, I want you to stay here, Selma. When you left the last time, I was hoping the days would hurry by until you returned. I'm too old to wish my days would hurry by. I'm glad you feel that way. I have things that I'd need to finalize. I have the house that I'd need to do something with if I were to leave. I'd love you to come to Colson County and see it. Mr. Stutzman nodded slowly. I would go anywhere to see more of you. Chapter 3 Being Born Again, Not of Corruptible Seed, But of Incorruptible by the Word of God, Which Liveth and Abideth Forever. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 Even though she knew it was wrong, Moira listened intently to the conversation of her two elderly friends. Not only had they agreed to go on a date, but Mr. Stutzman had even said that he'd go to Colson County just to see Selma again. In Moira's mind, the things that Michael had said to Selma were as good as admitting that they were a couple. Moira sat up in bed shook her head and sighed. Then she rolled over and grunted, her mind drifting off to thoughts of the Stutzman boys, and how they would take the news that their father was interested in a woman. Moira felt pains in her stomach as she stressed about the old couple. Part of her felt like it wasn't her business, but a larger part of her was furious that the old man would be willing to put his happiness before that of his family. She pulled the quilt over her face and closed her eyes. She was grateful that Millie was still sleeping, and hoped that if she had a quick nap herself that it would put her in better spirits. Later that day, Moira woke to a gentle tapping against her bedroom door. Even though it was already open, it annoyed her that someone felt the need to tap and wake her from her sleep. She rubbed at her eyes and moaned as she rolled over in bed. Looking toward the door, she saw Tom standing there with a weary smile on his lips. Good evening, he greeted. Is that baby still making you tired throughout the day? Millie? Moira asked, concerned about her toddler. It's okay, Tom said. Selma's looking after her downstairs. Are you still feeling tired all through the day? Sometimes, but that's not why I took a nap earlier today. I must have slept most of the day. Selma is cooking the midday meal. Do you want to get out of bed and come eat downstairs? Or do you want me to bring some food up to you? I'll come down in a minute, Moira said. Tom smiled and went to walk out of the room. Wait, she called out, extending her hand to stop him. Come in here, please. I need to talk to you about something, about why I came up here and ended up taking a nap. Tom walked toward the bed and sat next to her. Go ahead, tell me what it is that you need to get off your chest. Moira looked deeply into his eyes. She didn't know what his response would be or how he would react. Keeping the news to herself, however, would be an impossible burden. It's about Michael and Selma. I think they might be getting involved with one another. Moira bit her lip, wondering how Tom might react. Tom's eyebrows drooped as his lips pressed together in a straight line. What are you talking about? Involved? As in dating each other, he asked. I think so, she replied, nodding. I don't know the exact extent of their relationship yet, but I overheard them talking about seeing each other even after Selma goes back to Colson County. Something is going on with them, but that's all I can say for certain so far. His eyebrows arched. That's great news. Both of them have faced such pain and heartbreak. I'm very happy for both of them. Moira frowned at him. 
she wanted to yell at him for not seeing things as she saw them. Why were men so blind to common sense sometimes? No, this is not great news. Do you have any idea how upset everyone is going to be? A confused look twisted Tom's face as she shook his head in disagreement. He leaned forward and touched her shoulder. Who would be upset about two people finding happiness long after losing their first loves? I think it's a wonderful and a delightful thing. Then with more emphasis he said, a rare and unique thing. Moira sighed, looking down at her hands as they rested upon her lap. She slowly looked back up at her husband and frowned. You only say that because you didn't know Mrs. Stutzman the way I did. You wouldn't think this is a good thing if you loved her in the way that I loved her. Moira sniffed as tears threatened. Why couldn't Tom just agree with her for once? Tom groaned. I didn't know her well enough? Did you forget that my family's property was and is still right next to the Stutzmans? Even though their property is large, we were still their closest neighbors besides your family. The Shants were on one side but my parents were on the other. I've known them almost my entire life. You just don't understand, Moira snapped. Michael's boys won't like this one bit and neither do I. If you want to support Michael and Selma, just do so without letting everyone know about it. I'm not going to eat now, I'll have something later. Tom looked as though he was about to say something, but he paused right before the words formed on his lips. Instead he stood up and walked out of the room, and then he closed the door gently behind him. Moira buried her face in the pillow and covered her ears. She wanted nothing more than for that night to hurry so she could sleep and not have to think. The next morning, Moira woke to the bright sun as it shone through her bedroom window illuminating the entire room. Tom always started before daybreak and was long gone. She wiped away the weariness from her eyelashes and sat up gazing outside to see the pale blue sky that painted a picture of beauty outside. Moira thought it would be a good day to see her sister, Hazel. If anyone understood her unhappiness about Mr. Stutzman's fondness for Selma, it would be one of her sisters. Moira pulled herself out of bed and headed downstairs. As she walked by the living room, she heard Selma's friendly voice calling for her. Moira? I haven't seen you since midday yesterday. Are you feeling okay? Freezing in place, Moira knew she wouldn't be able to avoid taking Selma with her when she visited Hazel. She stepped into the living room where she saw Selma sitting on the floor playing with Millie. Yeah. I wasn't feeling like myself yesterday. I'm feeling much better now. Are you heading out somewhere? Selma asked. I was just on my way to visit Hazel. Would you like to come along for the ride? Moira figured Hazel's two children could keep Selma occupied while she talked to Hazel. Selma immediately leapt to her feet. I would love to go with you. Then hurry up, get ready and meet me outside. Thank you for looking after Millie so I could sleep so much yesterday. Moira walked over to Millie, leaned over and took her hand. It was a pleasure. You'll need to eat before you go, though. I'm not hungry at all. I can always have something at Hazel's house. Have you eaten, and Millie? Yeah, we've eaten. Just let me give you something? Moira smiled at Selma. She knew Selma was always helpful to her and she wished she could be happy for her. Moira nodded. I guess I should have a little food. You certainly should. I've set breakfast aside for you. Selma walked into the kitchen with Moira close behind. Selma pulled a plate of food out from the oven. Sit down and eat slowly. There's no rush, is there? Moira shook her head. Thank you, Selma. There's no hurry at all. Moira placed Millie in the high chair. I'll put her in here while you get ready. Selma headed to her room while Moira ate her food. She was grateful for Selma taking on so much of the responsibility of the household chores to give her a rest. Once she'd finished her food, Moira rinsed her plate and placed Millie on her hip. She walked to the bottom of the stairs and called out to Selma, I've already got a bag packed for Millie. We'll wait for you in the buggy. I'll be right down, Selma called back. Moira headed outside, then placed Millie in the buggy while she hitched it to the horse. Millie and Moira sat in the buggy and waited for their passenger. Moira looked out over the road and followed it with her eyes until it reached the horizon, far off into the distance. She hoped that Hazel could settle her fears and might whisper some words of wisdom about Michael and his plans of romancing Selma. Was she selfish in hating the idea of Michael dating again, 
or possibly remarrying? After several minutes of waiting, Selma ran out of the house, holding handfuls of her long dress in her hands to avoid getting it soiled. Selma climbed into the buggy and looked at Moira with a tired smile. Sorry it took so long, she gasped. You should have let me hitch the buggy. I can still do things for myself. It's completely fine. Are you ready to go see my sister and her lively children? Selma smiled sweetly. Yeah, I'm ready. With that, Moira snapped at the rein, sending the horse into motion. The initial jolt caused the pair to tremble. She looked over at little Millie and chuckled, after seeing the startled look on her face. I'm sorry, Millie, Moira said to her daughter. After the short trip to Hazel's house, Moira tied the horse to the post. When she looked at the house, she saw that Hazel was already standing outside on the porch. There you are, Hazel said. I haven't seen you in quite a while. She ran to Moira and wrapped her up in an extremely tight hug. When her sister had finally let go, Moira looked down to see two of Hazel's children holding onto her legs. Auntie, they sang out. Moira leaned down and hugged the children while Selma got Millie out of the buggy. Do you remember my really nice friend, Miss Selma? Moira asked the two young children while glancing up at Selma. The two children giggled. Selma laughed and then greeted Hazel. I'll keep the children entertained if you two girls want to catch up by yourselves. No, you must join us for coffee and cake, Selma. My children are well practiced at playing quietly, Hazel said. I take every chance I can to be in the company of children, Selma said. All right then. Hazel agreed and put an arm around Selma as they all walked into Hazel's home. Are you sure you don't mind looking after the children? Moira asked Selma once they were inside. I'd love to. Selma placed Millie on her other hip and held out a hand to the youngest of Hazel's children as they led her off to their bedroom to play. Did you just do that on purpose? Hazel asked Moira, smiling all the while. It wasn't my idea. Selma likes nothing more than to be with children. I'm glad because I need to talk to you in private about something very important. Of course. Hazel motioned for Moira to follow her into another room. Hazel led her inside and pointed toward the sofa. Go ahead, sit down and tell me what has you so flustered. You can tell? Moira walked over to the sofa and collapsed onto it. Hazel sat beside her and gripped her hand in her own. Slowly looking back up at her older sister, Moira sighed before speaking. So, I overheard Michael Stutzman talking to Selma yesterday. I think they're going on a date later today, and they even made plans for him to visit her when she goes back home. I'm so torn in my feelings because I care about both of them so much, but I feel like it's a betrayal of Anna. Moira blinked rapidly as she spoke of Mrs. Stutzman. It's like he's forgotten her. Or it's like she never even existed. Hazel looked down and frowned. Well, I'm certain that the Stutzman boys will be very upset to hear the news, but I'm not. He'd never forget Anna, I don't think you're seeing things clearly. Moira's chest tightened, making it difficult to breathe. She gasped for air, trying to make sense of her sister's reaction. You loved Anna just as much as I did. How could you just not care about him betraying her like that? He's not trying to betray or hurt anyone, Moira. Mr. Stutzman is an older man who lost the person he loved most in life. He and Selma are both trying to restore the happiness that they once had. He's been so lonely the past few years. Maybe Selma will be good for him. Moira nodded, even though annoyance ran through her body. She couldn't believe that her own sister was taking Selma's side. Then Moira and Hazel talked about Anna Stutzman, and the good times their family and the Stutzman family had shared throughout the years. An hour and a half later, Selma put her head around the door. I'm sorry to interrupt, but the little ones are playing contently, and I looked at the clock and realized that I should be getting back to Moira's house. Michael is supposed to pick me up soon. He's taking me out today. Selma smiled, and her cheeks turned as red as a rosy apple. Looking over at Hazel, Moira arched an eyebrow. Even though Moira loved Selma, the way she was acting like a love-struck teenager was more than bothersome. Okay, we'll head back, Moira replied almost with a sigh. When Moira looked back at Hazel, she caught her mouthing something to Selma. Was she wishing them luck or something? Moira grunted as she shook her head and rose from the sofa. Chapter 4 
And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 Selma decided to walk outside and wait for Moira by the buggy. As she scuttled up the dirt driveway, she lifted her dress and shook it gently to free the muck from it. She leaned against the buggy and looked up at Hazel's house. It wasn't the most breathtaking home she'd ever seen, but it was a typical home out in the countryside. Back in Colson County the houses looked different, perhaps they were a bit more modern. As the topic of home designs quickly faded from her mind, they were replaced by thoughts of Moira's recent irritation with her. Selma wasn't quite sure why her friend seemed so distant all of a sudden, but she could sense that Moira wasn't happy about her date with Mr. Stutzman. Ever since he'd shown up and asked her out, Moira had acted strangely. At first it didn't make much sense, but after thinking it over, Selma was able to piece things together and work out the cause of Moira's irritation. She had recalled stories that Moira often told of sewing with Hazel, at Mrs. Stutzman's home nearly every day. Moira and Hazel must have developed a bond with Anna Stutzman. As much as Selma desired Moira's approval and acceptance, she now realized that it wasn't going to come quickly. She knew that it couldn't be easy for Moira to see Mr. Stutzman interested in another woman. Maybe Moira thought that if Michael was happy, it meant that he missed Anna a little less. Selma looked up at the sky. Maybe Mr. Stutzman had thought about his wife a little less, and she had thought about Bob a little less, but was that a bad thing? It took nothing away from the love that they each held for those who had passed. The sound of Moira shutting the front door of her sister's house jolted Selma back to the present moment. You seemed like you were in a hurry inside. Are you even ready yet? Moira called out as she walked toward her. Seeing Moira without Millie, Selma asked, Are you forgetting something? Moira stopped still and pressed her lips together as if in deep thought. Ah, Millie. Both ladies laughed and Selma said, You stay here, I'll get her. Before Selma got to the door, Hazel met her with Millie in her arms. We nearly forgot the little one, Selma said. No, it wasn't you. It was my sister. Hazel leaned in and whispered to Selma, Don't mind Moira, she's not herself lately. She's dreadfully irritable, don't think that you've done anything wrong. I get a bit grumpy too when I'm expecting. Selma whispered back, Thank you, Hazel. I'll keep it in mind. Selma turned and headed back to Moira, who was already sitting in the buggy ready to go. With Millie in her hands, Selma climbed inside the buggy and slouched back in the seat. She looked up at the pale blue sky and sighed. Selma wondered how to approach the subject and ask Moira if she'd done anything at all to upset her, but not a single word popped into her head. She wanted to talk to Moira about herself and Michael and bring it all out into the open, but she just couldn't find the right words to start such a conversation. Selma gave a sideways glance at Moira and saw that her eyes were steadily focused on the road ahead. It was then that Selma realized how deafening the silence between them was. Moira had always been a friendly, outgoing person, but now, instead of her bubbly self, she had been reduced to a silent, distant stranger who didn't have a single word to say. With the desire to break the silence and remove the tension from the buggy, Selma decided to drop the thoughts of her date with Mr. Stutzman and focus on a happier topic. So those little crumb snatchers of Hazel's can be a handful, but boy are they so much fun to be around. Moira slowly turned her head and smiled at Selma for the first time since the day before. Crumb snatchers. That's a good one. Yeah, they're darlings, aren't they? I don't get to see them as much as I'd like to, but when I'm able to visit, it's always a pleasure to see their cute little faces. Selma smiled, happy that she was able to see Moira return to her old self again, even if it was only temporary. Well, it's a pretty good nickname if you ask me, she said jokingly. They put their tiny little hands on anything they can reach. The pair shared a lighthearted laugh. Moira turned to Selma. Thank you for looking after the children so I could talk to my sister today. It's difficult to have a quiet word with her sometimes. You're welcome. I love to play with the children. Children are so filled with wonder and such joy. It's refreshing. After they had pulled into the yard at Moira's house, Selma glanced at Moira and grinned. Is there anything you need help with before I go inside to get ready? Moira shook her head, her joy dissolving back into one of despondency. 
Don't worry about that, Selma, just go get ready for your date, she said avoiding eye contact. Selma nodded, climbed down from the buggy, and then she headed inside without saying another word. Once inside the house, Selma grew excited about spending time alone with Mr. Stutzman. Her worry about what Moira might think was taken over by a fluttering sensation in her stomach that made all her worries disappear. She walked into her bedroom and decided to put on a clean dress for the occasion. After she pulled the dress over her head, she caught a glimpse of herself in the windowpane. You definitely need to fix that prayer cap of yours. She untied her prayer cap and unbraided her long brown hair. As she dragged the brush through, she noticed that more silver was appearing through her hair every day. Selma tied her hair into two long braids, wound them on her head and fixed them onto her head with pins before placing her prayer cap back on her head. She chose to wear her plum-colored dress, hoping it might give her face a little more color. Selma wanted to look her absolute best, even though she was sure that looks weren't important to Michael. After changing into the plum-colored dress, Selma pulled the starched apron over her head. A giddy youthful feeling washed over her, making her feel like a teenager in love for the first time. With a smile that just wouldn't go away, she slipped on her boots just in time to hear a knock on her bedroom door. Yeah. Michael is waiting for you outside, Moira's voice answered through the closed wooden door. Thank you, I'm coming. Selma headed for the door and pulled it open. By the time she had done so, however, Moira was already out of sight. She had hoped to have a quiet word with Moira before she left. All Selma wanted was for Moira not to be so upset about her developing relationship with Michael. It made sense to Selma that since Moira had cared so much for Anna Stutzman, she should want Anna's husband to be happy. Chapter 5 for whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord, whether we live therefore. Or die, we are the Lord's. Romans chapter 14 verse 8 When Selma got to the front door, the sight of Michael Stutzman put a smile on her face. She forgot about every thought and every worry that she'd had that morning. All she saw now was a day with the man she wanted to get to know better, the man who made her feel alive again for the first time in years. I hope you're well today, he said with a smile. I am, thank you. Right this way. He held her arm gently, led her to the buggy, and then helped her into it. Then he ran around to the other side and hopped in. With a quick flick of his wrist, they were off, and their first official date had finally gotten underway. As they drove through the countryside, they spoke about various things, from the weather to ideas for the future. With each discussion, Selma's affections for Mr. Stutzman grew deeper. I was hoping that you wouldn't mind coming to my place for tomorrow night. Miriam, my daughter-in-law, will be cooking, and all my boys will be there. I'd love for them to get to know you better. I'd like that very much. Selma nodded, making sure to keep up the look of happiness that currently rested on her face. Part of her was nervous, even though she had already met them previously during her other visits to Earl Town. Yeah, that sounds good, she lied. She couldn't help her nerves because she had already seen Moira's reaction and feared that the Stutzman boy's reactions would be far worse. Mr. Stutzman turned to her and laughed. You're terrible at covering your feelings, he said jokingly. You don't have to be afraid of my boys, they won't bite. No, but they might hate me, she said, looking away with heat rising in her cheeks. She glanced out at the passing trees as the buggy continued traveling toward his house. I honestly don't see how anyone could ever hate you. When my boys see you at the family dinner tomorrow, they'll know that something is growing between us. If they have any objections, then we can discuss it, but until then, let's make the most out of how we feel, he insisted. Selma looked back at him as a smile tried to form on her lips. But even if your boys are okay with it and give us their approval, they aren't the only ones that this will affect. Mr. Stutzman tilted his head as one eyebrow arched higher than the other. What are you saying? Who else would be upset by the news of our mutual attraction? Moira for one. She hasn't said anything to me, but ever since yesterday she has been acting differently. I know her quite well, and I think she has a hard time accepting that you're willing to move on from someone she loved so much. He looked at her intently and shook his head. My dear, what others think is not our concern and our business is not theirs. I hope that my boys will give us their approval and be happy for me, but if not, that's not our concern. What happens between you and I stays between you, me and God, he said, looking up at the sky and pointing. 
He smiled as he looked back at her. We don't need to be ashamed of what we feel for each other. Selma looked into his eyes, his words sending a sense of relief through her worried mind. I understand that, but it's still troubling. Moira has been one of my closest friends since my sister passed away, and seeing her so tormented because of me is difficult. I just don't like how it makes me feel, and if your boys were to feel how she does it might be too much for me," she explained. Mr. Stutzman shook his head once more. I'll make sure that my sons know that I'm keen on the idea of having a relationship with you. They deserve the respect of knowing, but if they can't accept my decision then they can do so but it will not change anything. I've always put their happiness above my own, but now that they're all grown men they'll have to understand a few things. And one of those things is that life goes on and life changes always. Selma felt his hand on her own as his fingers fell between each of hers. She looked up slowly and smiled sweetly. Was it all in her mind, or did it seem like things could turn out well for her? He hadn't said it specifically yet, but Michael had to be thinking about asking her to marry him soon. His words and his actions made her certain that he did want them to have a future together as man and wife. Selma and Michael had spent the whole day together, and it was late in the afternoon when Michael brought Selma back to Moira's house. Mr. Stutzman gave a wave to Selma as his buggy drove away. She smiled and waved before turning and walking toward the front porch of the house. Climbing the steps, she wondered what she would say to Moira if she asked how the date had gone. Should she tell her the truth, or would a white lie be kinder? Standing in front of the door, Selma froze like a small child who had been forgotten out in the cold. As her fingers trembled, a strange sensation washed over her. She knew that tomorrow would be a huge changing point for her relationship with Mr. Stutzman, but only if others had an open heart and an open mind. If his boys were to give their blessings at dinner, Moira would be the only person she knew of who was opposed to their relationship. She hoped that she wouldn't lose Moira's friendship. Selma sighed as she pushed the front door open. As it creaked to let her in, she winced, hoping the noise hadn't been loud enough to alert the household to her return. Then she closed the door and headed to her room, only to be caught off guard as she turned the corner. There you are, Moira said, nearly being startled herself in the process. How was your evening? she asked, lighting a candle and walking toward the living room. My day was delightful. He even invited me to his place for dinner tomorrow night. He wants to introduce me properly to his boys and their families. Selma thought about her date and how magnificent it had been. She only wished it had never ended, because every minute without Michael was like an eternity. Part of her wanted to head to bed to pass the night quicker, but she decided against it and followed Moira into the living room. Even though Selma was more than curious to see where things would lead with Mr. Stutzman, first she had to talk to her friend about the relationship. She needed Moira to see things from her perspective. She wanted her to understand how much she and Mr. Stutzman cared for each other and how happy they were when they were together. Maybe then Moira would accept their decisions and offer her approval. As Selma walked in and took a seat, Moira's eyes never left her. Selma watched her just as intently, noticing that her lips had formed a pout. Selma shook her head and sighed before she could stop herself. Why couldn't Moira accept the way things were? Moira, I know it is still difficult for you but Michael and I have grown close. We're interested in each other, and I think we both deserve to be happy. The way he makes me smile is like nothing I've experienced in years," she said before being interrupted. That's nice but did you hear about old man Charles? The neighbors found him wandering down by the creek again," Moira interjected. Selma paused and shook her head, feeling defeated. She knew that Moira was only talking about their old neighbor because she wanted to change the subject. With things snowballing out of control in her mind, she balled her hands into fists as a wave of frustration flowed through her. It took quite a resolve to not let her frustrations bubble over into anger, but Selma was able to keep her composure. Just then Tom poked his head into the room. His warm smile added a much-needed brightness to the atmosphere. Hello, Selma. I hope you don't mind, but I was walking by and overheard the news. Congratulations. It is so wonderful that you and Michael have found each other. After the heartache you've both suffered, it only makes sense that two halves would come together to make a whole. Thank you, Tom, Selma said. Anyway, Moira grunted, shooting a glare at her husband. I was just telling Selma about old man Charles and the way he's been wandering about. Tom glanced at his wife and smiled. Okay, 
I'll leave you two to your conversation, he said before disappearing back into the hallway. The meal will be ready soon, Tom, Moira called after her husband. Moira turned back to Selma. They had one of the policemen over at their farm earlier checking for Charles. I almost feel bad for the poor man, but it's clear that he just can't let the past go. I've heard stories of what happened to him, but who knows how true they really are, Moira said. Selma stared off into nothingness as the world faded away around her. Moira's words fell on deaf ears as Selma focused solely on her own thoughts. She was certain that the choice should be left up to her and Mr. Stutzman. After all, they were both consenting adults with nothing to hold either of them back. If his sons would be willing to overlook their selfish desires and give their father their approval, then perhaps Moira would change her mind and offer hers as well. And if she still couldn't accept it then, she would at least be able to cope with the decision. The racket was enough to wake me from a nap earlier. The baby has been tiring me out so the noise was not welcome, Moira said, still rambling about the neighbors. That's a shame but I feel very tired myself, Selma replied. Do you need help with the dinner tonight? The meat is nearly cooked and everything else is ready. I'll go and set the table, Selma said as she rose to her feet. Dinner went by quickly, and after Selma helped Moira clear the dishes and wash up, she excused herself. I'm going to try to get some rest, so that I'm ready for tomorrow. I hope you have a good night, sleep well. Moira looked at her and nodded. Good night, she said, sipping coffee from her teacup. With that, Selma turned away and walked to her bedroom with a lantern to light the way. Thoughts swirled through her mind as she wondered about how dinner would go the next day. Would his boys understand, or would they react just as bad as Moira did when she first learned of their attraction to each other? Selma woke the next morning to the sound of birds chirping outside her window. The pale light from the morning sun shone through her windows, illuminating her small bedroom. Glancing out the window, she smiled, as a sense of goodwill welled up within her stomach. Selma felt confident for the first time in a long time. As the day dragged by, the anticipation ate away at Selma's stomach. She would have to wait to see how the boys and their families would react to the news. Would seeing their father happy be enough to cause them to let go of their own selfish requests, or was it all for naught? Once the afternoon approached, Selma had sent her negative thoughts away and was now excited. The hour was nearly upon them, and everything would finally be revealed to Michael's sons. In just a matter of hours, she would know for sure where she and Mr. Stutzman stood. If only she knew whether to be happy or worried, she might be more prepared for whatever reaction she was about to receive. About an hour before dinner was set to begin, a gentle knock at the front door caused Selma's ears to perk up. She leaped from the sofa and headed for the door. Mr. Stutzman's broad smile greeted her. Good evening to you, he said. Smiling, Selma nodded. Good day to you. I haven't told anyone that you are coming to dinner, he whispered, leaning in to kiss the back of her hand. I want us to both see their honest reactions when they first hear the truth from their own father, he explained. Chapter 6 And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew chapter 10 verse 28 Michael had just told Selma that he hadn't told his boys that she'd be coming to dinner. Selma would have preferred that Michael's family had been warned of her coming there. While it was a bit scarier knowing that his sons wouldn't already be expecting some sort of news, Selma wondered whether Mr. Stutzman might be right. Perhaps seeing their reactions for the first time would be a better way to gauge their true feelings on the topic of their father's new relationship. All Selma wanted was their verbal approval, regardless of how they truly felt deep down. It was most likely normal for the boys to feel a little awkward to see their father with another woman. I just hope the news goes over well, she said to Michael. As do I, Mr. Stutzman replied, ushering her out of Moira and Tom's house. Selma turned back and shouted goodbye, in hopes of being heard by Tom and Moira. When they were in the buggy, Michael yanked at the reins, jolting the buggy into motion. He turned toward her and grinned. This should be quite a night, he said in a jovial tone. Selma didn't smile when Michael smiled at her, she was far too nervous. Usually she would laugh at any of his comments and appreciate his humor, but today her future was on the line. It was almost as if her hopes and dreams dangled in front of her, hanging above a pit of animals. Would they snatch her chance at happiness away from her for their own good, 
or would they turn away and let her dreams reach reality? When they arrived at his home, Mr. Stutzman pulled in and parked by the barn. Turning toward her he smiled and held her hand in his. I know this might be a bit daunting, but you and I are in this together. I won't let a wrong word be breathed. Selma looked back at him and nodded, her lips creasing into a smile. She could sense the sincerity in his voice as he spoke, but it wasn't he that she was fearful of. Once she glanced up at the house she realized that inside were all five of his sons, their wives and their children. If the five boys resented her, would that equal an entire house of people that did as well? You mustn't look so afraid, Mr. Stutzman insisted. From the beginning, we don't have to mention the actual purpose of this dinner. Let's just enjoy it, and I will introduce you as my guest and nothing more until the time is right. Would that make you feel more at ease, he asked. Yeah. Selma was relieved. Then let's do that, he said climbing down from the buggy and then heading over to help her down. The pair walked toward the house and glanced at each other smiling. Selma took a deep breath as they climbed the steps of the porch toward the front door. Mr. Stutzman turned the doorknob and pushed his way in, motioning for her to follow. When Selma walked inside, she immediately heard an eruption of noise coming from a room down the hall. Walking closely behind Mr. Stutzman, they finally came upon the dining room. When she entered before Michael, the room fell silent. Selma could hear the children playing nearby, but every adult in the room looked at her, frozen in silence. She saw all the Stutzman boys and their wives. Selma had met his boys on several occasions, but she knew that their reception of her might now be different when they learned the truth about her relationship with their father. As they continued further into the room, Mr. Stutzman shook hands with his sons as he greeted them and exchanging hugs with their wives. Vader, his oldest Adam said, rushing over and slapping his father affectionately on his shoulder. I'm happy you finally got here finally, he added. Then his eyes suddenly focused on Selma. His brows furrowed as he tilted his head. And you brought Selma with you? Yeah, Mr. Stutzman replied. She and I have been spending time together, and I asked her for dinner so you could all get to know each other better. Selma's gaze flickered downward. Michael had said he wouldn't let them know that their relationship was heading in a romantic direction. Now Michael's family would know that she was there because they were growing close. Of course, Adam said. It's just that she usually only comes here when Moira and Tom stop by, and I hadn't seen them yet so I was caught unaware. Since it was the first time Selma had ever shown up at the Stutzman home without Tom or Moira, Adam's excuse was believable. Still, she felt a strange sensation in her throat every time she caught one of Michael's sons looking at her. Dinner is just about ready to begin, Miriam called out to everyone. Please take your seats and let's enjoy this feast, Michael said. He then whispered to Selma, Come with me and pay them no mind. Mr. Stutzman grasped her hand and led her to the table. He pulled out one of the chairs for her to sit in, and once she had, he pulled out the one next to hers and sat down. Look at this food. Doesn't it look wonderful, he asked. It certainly does, Selma replied brightly, not wanting to alert him to her discomfort. Everyone said their own silent grace and then dove into the meal. As Selma scooped some potatoes onto her plate, she caught a glimpse of Moira's sister, Miriam. The food is lovely, Miriam. Miriam was now seated across the table beside her husband, the oldest Stutzman boy, Adam. Thank you, Selma. I do like to cook. So, Dad, how has work been? His youngest son asked. It's been busy. Things here on the farm have been rather good, but a few neighbors and friends have been struggling with their crops. I've been helping the Winsteads build a pen for their sheep. I took today off, but we should have it up by the end of the week, Mr. Stutzman explained. That's great to hear, Adam chimed in. He glanced over at Miriam and smiled before looking back toward Selma. Has Selma been helping with that pen? He asked, nodding toward his father's guest. Mr. Stutzman whipped his head toward her and then back to his son. Excuse me, he said, seemingly just as caught off guard by the remark as Selma was. Adam shot back a wry grin and took a bite of the meat that was on his fork. As he chewed it, he chuckled as if he was laughing at a joke that only he could hear. The table had fallen silent and all eyes were on Adam. Oh, I was just curious. You said that you've been so busy with farm work and helping the Winsteads, so I figured she might be helping. That would explain why you two have been together so much. Well, if rumors are true, he quipped, looking at Selma once more. Selma's hand immediately fiddled nervously with the strings of her prayer cap. 
She leaned into Michael and said, Maybe I shouldn't be here. Nonsense, he mumbled to her. Then looking across at his oldest son, he leaned forward and spoke firmly. Selma is staying in town to assist her friend and your sister-in-law, Moira, while Moira's in her delicate state. You're all well aware of that, he added, glancing at each of his children as he said it. Selma and I are friends and enjoy each other's company. And if we were to want more. Don't, Selma whispered, placing her hand on top of Mr. Stutzman's hand. I think we should stop there. Michael looked at her and nodded, stopping himself from finishing his sentence. He turned back to his oldest boy and sighed. Can't we just enjoy this meal as a family? The oldest son looked down at his plate and groaned. Selma watched Miriam lean over and whisper into Adam's ear. Of course, Dad. I'm sorry, it's been a long day. Adam turned to Miriam and smiled. Miriam gave a quick smile back and looked down at the plate of food in front of her. Dinner moved along from there without any more talk of how it was odd that Selma was there. When dinner was over, they all left the table and retired to the living room. Selma stayed seated with Michael a while longer. Selma heard two of Michael's younger boys talking as they walked out of the dining room. Curious as to what they were discussing, she leaned back in her chair and heard, Do you really think they are just friends? Selma listened intently to determine if they were speaking about her or not, but then Adam spoke abruptly. Dad, I don't mean to put you or your friend on the spot, but can I ask you something that I've been asking myself for days? Selma whipped her head back toward the table, and her eyes fell on Adam. He smiled from ear to ear, he sure did look smug right then. Mr. Stutzman looked at Selma briefly before glancing back at his son. Go on, he said. Why now? Adam asked. What are you talking about? Mr. Stutzman's brows pinched together, deepening the weary lines in his forehead. You haven't brought another woman to dinner since mother's been gone. Why would you bring one now? This is not going well. Selma looked at Mr. Stutzman, wondering what he would say. The remaining family members in the room fell silent. Apprehension rose up in Selma, as everyone in the entire room shifted their gaze to her. Mr. Stutzman stuttered as he struggled with a response. Listen, you are not, he paused and took a deep breath. Nobody is going to embarrass me or my friend like this. I might not have had another woman to dinner before since your mother died, but that's because I've been too busy being the vadder and grandfather that my family needed. He cleared his throat deeply, stood up and extended his hand to Selma. Come, let's get you home. My son is very sorry for his rudeness tonight, aren't you? Michael turned and glared at Adam. His son gulped, swallowing the lump that had apparently been stuck in his throat. I'm sorry, Dad. Selma, I didn't mean to insult you, it's just that I don't see why we can't all talk about this. Everyone is asking themselves what's going on with the pair of you. I was just speaking what everyone was thinking. I expected more of you, Adam, Mr. Stutzman said. I raised you better than that, I thought. Mr. Stutzman ushered Selma out of the room. Selma wondered if Adam was only trying to have an open conversation about something that would concern all of them. Perhaps he truly didn't mean to be insulting or rude. When the front door closed behind them, they stood on the porch overlooking the driveway. I'm so sorry about that, he said. I figured that they might be a bit bothered or annoyed to see us so happy together, but I never imagined that my eldest son could be so rude. She put her hand on his back and patted gently. Selma didn't know how to comfort him best or what to say, so she offered the best support that she could. It'll be okay, she said. Mr. Stutzman looked at her and sighed. Come, let's get you home. They climbed down the steps of the front porch and walked over to his buggy. Selma climbed inside and lounged back in the seat. As she closed her eyes, she thought about dinner and the looks on every face that she'd seen. Most of Michael's children looked unhappy, but perhaps that was because they had sensed the tension in the room. Would Michael want to continue their relationship? Before the dinner, he had said he wouldn't care what their reactions were. But what did he think now that he'd heard their reactions? All Selma wanted was to experience happiness, but it was becoming clear that her happiness might very well come at the expense of others. When Mr. Stutzman had readied the horse, he got into the buggy and whipped the reins. As they drove off toward Moira's house, Selma looked over at him solemnly. I know that you won't be happy to hear this, but I think I know what must be done, she said. His eyebrows drooped as his face twisted into a look of confusion. 
What do you mean? he asked. Selma looked out at the trees as they passed by in a quick blur. She sighed and spoke softly without glancing back at Mr. Stutzman. I didn't come all the way here from Colson County to make everyone upset. I came here to help a good friend of mine, and even she is unhappy with me now. I'm sorry, she said, looking down at her lap. But I can't continue to see you like this. I think it would be in both of our best interests to end this before it's too late. Mr. Stutzman's jaw fell open as he stared at her in shock. But, but don't you, he stuttered, trying to formulate a sentence. I'm so sorry, but your family will never accept me, and I can't be the reason that you and your boys don't see eye to eye. I just can't be that reason. Selma put her hands to her eyes and cried. She sobbed into her hands as the buggy continued toward her friend's home. Chapter 7 Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? John chapter 11 verses 25 to 26 As the buggy stopped at Moira and Tom's farm, Mr. Stutzman looked over at Selma and shook his head. Hush, don't cry, Selma. Things will work out for us. Selma could tell that he was bothered by what had happened at dinner, but nothing was going to instantly fix all their problems. She felt as though her happiness could only come at the expense of others, and that was something that Selma couldn't accept. Michael placed his hand on top of hers and smiled sweetly. I know that tonight didn't exactly go as planned, but it only has to be a setback, he explained. You don't have to blame yourself for others being miserable, that's their choice. This is about you and me. Selma sniffed and wiped her eyes. She sighed and slowly met his eyes with her own. I'm sorry, Michael, but I just can't talk about this right now. I think I need to be alone for a while. Mr. Stutzman looked at her and the corners of his lips turned downward. His eyes glossed over as the tears seemed to well up behind them. Selma felt even more horrible than she already did. Not only was she the reason everyone else was upset, but also now she was even hurting the man she cared for most. Okay, he said. I suppose I'll hear from you sooner or later, he added, never looking back up. He went to get out of the buggy. Don't. I can get down myself, thank you. Selma sighed and climbed down from the buggy. She walked toward the front steps and reached the door. As she reached for the doorknob, she was startled by the sound of Mr. Stutzman's buggy pulling away from the house. She turned back to look at him and saw nothing but darkness. Selma hung her head, walked into the house and closed the door behind her. As she headed inside, various sounds pulled her attention toward the kitchen. Peeking in, Selma saw Moira fixing herself some tea and figured she would say hello. Oh, you're still awake? Selma said, startling her friend. Oh, she shouted, turning around abruptly with a look of shock on her face. Selma couldn't help but laugh at Moira's comical expression. Her eyes had enlarged while her eyebrows arched on her forehead and her bottom jaw fell open. I didn't mean to frighten you, Selma said. Moira took several deep breaths and then rolled her eyes, letting a chuckle fall from her lips. It's fine. I just wasn't expecting you home so early, she said. How did dinner go? Selma noticed that Tom wasn't around, but she figured he had called it an early night to ready himself for a morning of hard work. She looked up at Moira and sighed. It wasn't exactly what I would call a pleasant evening. His boys didn't take me being there at all well, especially Adam. What happened? Nothing specifically, just a lot of uncomfortable looks and whispers about me. Well, until Adam made a few barbed comments, that's when things really got out of hand. Selma walked toward the counter to pour herself some tea. He asked Mr. Stutzman why now out of nowhere. Confused, he looked at his son and asked what he meant. The reply was, you have yet to bring any woman to dinner since mom's death. Why did you bring one now? Moira took a sip from her cup of tea and then glared at Selma, a look of compassion adding a sense of gentleness to her demeanor all of a sudden. Well, I would never kick someone while they were down, but did you truly expect anything else? Those boys love their mother dearly, they aren't going to forgive Mr. Stutzman for betraying her. Selma sighed and rolled her eyes, making sure to hide the latter gesture from Moira. But that doesn't make any sense. How is he betraying anyone, she asked. Moira looked over at Selma. Then Moira began pacing around the kitchen as she spoke in a hushed tone. What neither of you see is the picture from our point of view. 
Take me, for instance. I grew up with Mrs. Stutzman just one house over. My sisters and I would go over and spend time with her. We did everything from helping her with the preparation of meals to learning how to sew and knit. She was like a second mother to us, and that's why I seemed so rude when I first learned of your and Michael's true intentions. Selma felt even worse now than she had earlier that evening. I'm sorry. You're right. I don't understand it but I guess I will have to accept it, she said, sliding her cup back onto the counter and giving up her quest for tea. Right then she wanted nothing more than to fall asleep and pass the night away. That is part of the problem, Moira said. If you and Mr. Stutzman were to take the time and listen to what we're trying to say, you both might see things differently. You guys don't see it as the betrayal that it is. Apparently not, Selma said. So why don't you explain it to me again? Moira shook her head and sighed. When you marry someone, you promise them your heart and commitment to them for life. The moment he marries you, his vows to his first wife are void. And on top of that, his sons don't approve, so if he ignores their feelings, that in itself is another betrayal. Selma rose to her feet and then tipped her tea down the sink. She walked to the doorway of the kitchen, then turned to Moira. Lots of people in the community have second marriages when their spouse dies. Why is it okay for everyone else across the country, but if Michael wants to do it, he gets the horrible reactions that you and his boys are giving him? How is that fair? How does it make sense? Moira sipped from her cup once more but never said a word in response to Selma's questions. All we want is to be happy, and with each other is where that happens most often, Selma added. Still, Moira said nothing in reply. Instead she turned her back on Selma and poured herself some more tea. Frustrated beyond belief, Selma decided to head to bed. The day had been filled with mixed emotions, but the ending had been anything but enjoyable. Well, I'm going to get some sleep. I apologize for startling you when I first came in. Selma disappeared into the dim hallway before Moira had a chance to say goodnight. When Selma reached her bedroom, she locked the door behind her. Falling back against its wooden surface, she crossed her arms over her chest, closed her eyes tightly and then sighed. Selma wondered if she should just give up on everything and head back home to Colson County. Moira seemed to be doing well enough, so she figured that her friend would be fine without a little extra help until the baby arrived. Besides, Moira had her own mother and father living close by. She didn't really need Selma's help. Opening her eyes, Selma trudged over to her bed and collapsed onto it, the soft mattress catching her falling body. She looked up at the ceiling, even though it was marred in darkness. Images of her happiest moments with Mr. Stutzman played over before her eyes. Maybe going home wasn't the right thing for her. Would it be a better idea to ignore everyone else and do what would make her happy? Everyone would surely get used to seeing her and Michael together after a while. Sheer exhaustion overwhelmed Selma's body and her eyes closed. Her last thought before falling asleep was a question that had lingered through her mind all night long. What was the right thing to do? go home, or stay here to risk being hated by everyone except Michael. The next morning Selma woke with her brain in a haze. She sat up immediately and rubbed at her eyes, a sense of confusion muddling her head. Trying to make sense of the strange way she felt, she lay back down and stared up at the ceiling. Then piece by piece her dream came back to her. It had felt so real while she was asleep, but now she could hardly remember what it had been about. As she thought back on it and let her body relax, several images popped into her head. Michael had been in the dream with her, that she remembered clear as day. Where had they been though? Selma rolled onto her side and thought harder. She then saw a field of yellowing grass beneath her feet, as she looked back up to see Michael before her. The look on his face was one of surprise and horror, his skin turning a bluish tint as he clutched at his chest. Her eyes quickly opened as the fear took over her emotions. Shaking it off, Selma took a deep breath and closed her eyes again, hoping to relive the remainder of the dream. This time, however, she saw nothing but blackness caused by her closed eyelids. Opening her eyes, she sat up on the edge of her bed and dangled her feet. She looked down and nodded, that was exactly how she felt right then. It was like she was dangling from high up with no one to catch her if she fell. She noticed a peculiar sound that she hadn't picked up on sooner. Her eyebrows drooped over her eyes. What was that noise? Walking over toward her door, she pulled it open and stuck her head out into the hallway. The sound was much louder and appeared to be coming downstairs. 
Selma quickly got dressed and then headed down to see what all the commotion was about. When she walked into the living room, she saw Moira sitting on the sofa with her hands over her face. She could hear the countless sobs as tears trickled down her friend's hands. Selma wasn't sure what was going on, and feeling a state of panic coming on, she looked around frantically for Tom. She heard voices in the kitchen and raced in to see that one of Mr. Stutzman's sons was at the house. He stood over near the stove talking in a low voice to Tom. What was going on? Selma paused as her dream rushed to the forefront of her thoughts. She walked over to Tom and Mr. Stutzman's son, but before she could speak, Tom looked at her and shook his head slowly. I'm so sorry, he said. Fear instantly paralyzed Selma, causing her chest to tighten as the hair on her arms stood to attention. What do you mean? she asked in disbelief. Why is he here? she added, looking at Michael's son. Just then, before Tom could respond, time stood still for Selma. It was like she was reliving the missing portion of her dream. In her dream Michael lay in the middle of a field of grass, clutching at his chest, but then things changed. There was nobody else around now, not even she was. It was almost as though Selma was watching the man she loved die alone in a field by himself. Tom's words jolted her back into the room. Michael suffered a heart attack this morning. He's in the hospital now, Tom said, pulling Selma right back to reality. What? she gasped. Chapter 8 And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2 verse 9 I wanted to stop by and let you all know before I went to see him at the hospital, Mr. Stutzman's son Jacob said. Selma stared at him blankly. It felt like her heart had stopped beating, and was now falling into the pit of her stomach. But, she said, struggling to speak, Is he going to be okay? Tom sighed, flashing her a worried frown as Moira continued to sob on the sofa. Jacob wiped at his eyes once more before walking toward the hallway. She could see the hurt and agony in his face as he spoke. We don't really know but it doesn't look good, he explained, shaking his head. The doctor said he'd do all that he can, but doctors aren't miracle workers. That was his opinion, not mine. Oh, Selma replied, looking down as a single tear fell from her right eye and tickled her cheek as it rolled down it. She glanced back up at Mr. Stutzman's son and frowned. You said that you were going to see him in the hospital after you leave here, right? Would it be okay if I took the ride with you, she asked. At first he seemed a bit hesitant, but after looking directly into her eyes, a sudden change of heart appeared to wash over him. Well, I wasn't planning on staying long but you're more than welcome to join me if you'd like to. Despite her shattered heart, Selma found solace in the fact that she would get to see Mr. Stutzman. She would be able to hold his hand one more time and let him know how much she cared. I would, she answered. She stared at Michael's son until his name came to mind. He was Jacob, the middle Stutzman boy. Okay, I'll wait for you outside then, Selma. Jacob walked toward the door. Are you sure it's a good idea for you to go with him to the hospital? Tom asked in a whisper, his eyes never leaving his wife. Maybe Moira could use you here. Selma sighed and shook her head, glancing down at the ground. I know it isn't the best situation, but I can't just leave Michael alone like that. Moira has you, but he only has his boys. I need to see him and know that he's okay, and he needs to know that I'm still here for him. For as long as he wants me around, I'll be here. Selma tried hard not to cry, but tears came to her eyes. She wiped them away with the back of her hand. Tom gave her a gentle hug. Don't give up yet, there's still a good chance he'll recover from this. Just go show him your support and things should be okay. She looked up at him and smiled. You're right, she said, wiping away the remaining tears as her eyes finally dried up. Selma walked over to the sofa and sat beside Moira. She gently gripped her hand and spoke softly as her friend looked at her intently. I will tell him that you send your love, she said. Moira nodded, swallowing a large lump in her throat. Tears continued to escape from her eyes as she sat there in disbelief. Please do, and let him know that Tom and I will be there to visit as soon as we can find someone to watch Millie for a few hours. Of course, and you know that as soon as I get back I'll watch her for you if you want to go see him. I'm sure he would appreciate that. Selma rubbed Moira's arm. Moira smiled and looked over at Tom, who was now standing over by the doorway. You should probably get going, though. 
I think Jacob will want to get going. Yeah, Selma said, her mind falling into a daze of confusion and forgetfulness. I can hardly think straight, she said with a groan. I'll be back later, in enough time to get the midday meal ready. Tom and Moira watched Selma as she headed outside to Jacob's buggy. As she approached, Jacob stood by her side of the buggy and helped her climb up into it. Hurrying over to the driver's side, he jumped in and whipped the reins, sending them barreling off toward the hospital. The drive to see Mr. Stutzman was rather silent, as Selma didn't know what to say to Jacob and she guessed that he felt the same. When they arrived, Jacob hurried into the small wooden hospital. As they walked down the hallway, she noticed empty rooms as she passed by them. Do you know where he is? she asked, a spooky sensation coming over her as she recalled her eerie dream. He's just at the end of this hall. Jacob pointed to a room at the end which was labeled Room 7. Selma's heart raced as her skin grew hot. As they arrived at his door, Jacob pushed the door open. There was a nurse in the room. Oh, hello. Are you here to see Mr. Stutzman? she asked. Yes, we are. I'm his son and this and this is his friend Selma. It's nice to meet you both, the nurse said, walking closer to the pair. She leaned over and whispered, he's doing better now but he's still very weak and sluggish. He hasn't really been able to speak much, just moans and grunts. We've been giving him some herbs for the pain, and now we're monitoring his breathing carefully. I'd suggest you don't stay too long, but I'm sure even if he can't say it, he's glad to see you both. The nurse left the room. Selma and Jacob exchanged a quick glance, and then turned to Mr. Stutzman, who was lying motionless in an uncomfortable-looking bed. Selma walked over to him and gently covered his right hand with both of hers. I know you can't talk or anything right now, but I hope you can at least hear me, she said. Just then she felt her hand being squeezed, and she saw Mr. Stutzman's head turning to look at her. A single tear fell from her cheek as she looked at him with utter despair. You need to get better. You have too many people counting on you to pull through this. Please don't leave us and don't leave me, she pleaded. Another squeezing sensation pulsated through her hands. She smiled at Michael, holding back the tears for his sake. The nurse said that we shouldn't stay long so that you can get some rest, but would you like it if I came here tomorrow to see you again? Selma was sure that she saw the corners of his lips twitch. Oh, I almost forgot. Moira and Tom send their love and will come see you as soon as they can, Selma said. She walked toward Jacob who was still standing by the door. You should go talk to him. He'll be happy to hear your voice, I'm sure, she said, hoping to encourage him. She could tell that Jacob was scared. Jacob swallowed hard. I know, but it's so hard to see him like that. I can't lose another parent. I just can't. Tears came to Jacob's eyes and Moira rubbed his shoulder. It's not easy at all, but nobody said it would be. I know you love your vatter, and right now, he needs to know that more than anyone else. Jacob stared into her eyes and then his lips formed a smile. Thank you for that, he said, shaking his head. Of all the people in the world, you're the one making me feel better during such a difficult time. You're a special lady. Jacob walked over to his father's bed and whispered a few words to him. Selma smiled and walked out into the corridor to give them some privacy. She glanced back into the room to see Jacob hunched over the bed crying. Part of her wanted to run back in and hug them both, but she knew that it was neither the time nor the place for such an act. Instead she waited patiently for Jacob. Minutes later Jacob joined her in the hallway. He wiped his eyes. Thank you Selma. Selma smiled at him, happy that she'd gotten to know one of the Stutzman boys a little better. They walked out of the hospital together, and once they were in the buggy, Jacob glanced over at Selma. I want to tell you that I am truly sorry for how I treated you the other night. The entire family is sorry, we all feel awful for how we acted and made you feel. Since Dad got sick, we've all been given a stark reminder of how precious life is. And then seeing you in that hospital room with my vatter, I just can't find it in my heart to dislike you anymore. Please forgive me. Forgive all of us, he said, tears dripping from his eyes. Selma wiped a tear from her own eye and laughed. We're an excellent pair crying like this. Selma sniffed a couple of times. I never meant to upset anyone, but your vatter means a lot to me. I just want him to be happy. Jacob nodded and let a grin form on his lips. I know you do, and I think that's how we all need to think. Who knows how much longer he'll have, he added, snapping his wrist and sending a message for the horse to go a little faster. 
Selma swallowed hard after hearing that remark but shrugged it off as they moved rapidly down the dirt road. Hopefully he has a fair bit longer. Nine days after Selma and his son had first visited him, Michael Stutzman had finally regained most of his strength. Selma entered the hospital room to see him sitting up of his own accord, eating some food that rested on a small tray. Hello, she greeted as she entered the room. Mr. Stutzman looked up at her, but instead of smiling or looking happy he frowned and let out a small sigh. Hello, he said. Selma's eyebrows suddenly felt heavy as confusion clouded her mind. She stepped closer to his bed and tilted her head in wonder. What's wrong, she asked. Mr. Stutzman cleared his throat and shook his head before speaking in a somber tone. I don't really know how to say this, but I think my sudden illness is proof that it's just not meant to be. What do you mean, she said, unsure what to think about his comment. With how ill I am now, I would be nothing more than a burden on you. My family has already caused you enough unhappiness, I can't do that to you, he said. We both know that I'm not going to last much longer. It's better for you if you go back to Colson County and forget all about me. Selma clutched at her heart, not believing her ears. After all they'd been through and how far they'd come, how could he say this now? Selma felt her warm tears as they streamed down her face. But I'd rather be with you, even if that means taking care of you all day, every day, she cried. Mr. Stutzman shook his head and sighed. I cannot do that to you, Selma. Please just forget me. Chapter 9 The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm chapter 27 verse 1 After walking outside the hospital, Selma glanced back at the old building and sighed. She filled her lungs with air and tried her best not to cry. She walked toward the buggy and readied herself for the trip back to Moira's house. Moira would be pleased that she wasn't going to marry Michael. The drive back to the house was a blur. Selma focused on nothing but Mr. Stutzman's decision. He seemed convinced that she should return to Colson County. Maybe he was right, though. There seemed to be nothing but hurt and disappointment for her in Earl Town, and she no longer wanted to subject herself to such things. Why continue to fight a battle that she was never meant to win? Maybe God has an easier road for me to go down. Selma busied herself unhitching the buggy and tending to the horse before walking to the front door of Moira's house. When she climbed the steps she hesitated, trying to think of what she would say to Moira. After waiting several seconds, she took a large gulp of air and opened the door. Walking inside, the first thing she saw was her friend in the hallway. Moira quickly whipped her head around when the door closed with a loud thud. Oh Selma, you're back so soon, she asked, her happy demeanor turned into one of confusion. Wait, what's wrong? Why do you look so devastated? she asked. Slowly looking up at Moira, Selma frowned and shook her head. I look like I'm crushed because I am, she replied. Can we talk about this elsewhere? I'm rather exhausted and need to sit down. Of course, Moira said, motioning for Selma to follow her into the living room. When they both sat on the sofa, Selma looked at Moira and sighed loudly before explaining everything. It's Michael. He doesn't think he has much more time. He feels like he's dying and doesn't want to be a burden to me. Even though I would truly rather take care of him every day than to be without him. She coughed and then continued. I told him that I would care for him for the rest of his days, but that meant nothing to him. He wants me to return to Colson County and forget about him. I can do one of those things but not both. Selma watched Moira carefully as tears welled up in her eyes. She saw her friend's pursed lips form into a pout as her normally smooth forehead formed a frown. Listen, I know that we do not always see eye to eye, but I think he's just scared. Something like that could make even the bravest person terrified. I know how he feels, though. I'd never like to be a burden on anyone, Moira explained. Oh. Well, I know he's afraid, but it is possible that he could make a complete recovery and be back to his old self in a matter of weeks or months, Selma said and how he could see it as a burden for me to care for the man I, never mind, Selma paused while shaking her head. To a man like Mr. Stutzman, who has always worked as much as he could to provide for his family and to help his friends, losing the ability to function normally would be heartbreaking. Perhaps his reasoning is twofold. One, he doesn't want your life to become nothing more than looking after a dying man. Two, 
He knows that it would bother him if he had to be waited on day and night like someone who was frail and helpless. Michael has almost always been a kind, friendly man, but we all have our dark side and maybe he is trying to save you from his. And even if that's how he's thinking right now, it doesn't mean he won't change his mind. When he sees his condition improving, I can't imagine he'd still want you to leave. Selma looked away, letting a sigh escape her lips as she glanced around the room. She hoped to find some kind of reason to stay. Looking back at Moira, she swallowed the lump in her throat and spoke softly. I think he's right though. No matter what his reasons truly are. Maybe I should just go away and never come back. Moira gasped and leaned closer to her. You cannot possibly mean that, she said. Why not? It would make everyone happier, even Michael, now. Selma was too weary to cry anymore. I don't think it would make anyone happier, to be honest. Even Adam has been talking very highly of you, and so has Jacob. My baby is nearly due to be born, and I certainly don't want you to go back home yet, Moira confessed. Despite her honesty and kind words, Selma just didn't think staying would be in her best interest after hearing Michael's words. Would you be okay if I were to go home soon? Selma stared at Moira. Yeah, I'd be okay. I have my mother nearby to help, but are you sure that is what you want to do? Moira replied. I don't want you to go, Tom and I love having you here. Selma nodded. I think it is time to go. Are you sure your mother would help? I don't see her around very often, Selma said. Well, that's because she's a peculiar woman always has been, Moira explained. When I was young, Hazel and I used to be left alone often. My mother is a loving person, but she has always preferred to be alone where possible. That led to us always ending up over at the Stutzman's home. Mrs. Stutzman was nothing like mother. She enjoyed being around others and sharing her happiness with everyone. She taught us a lot about life and things our parents should have taught us. Selma stared at Moira and knew that Moira was telling her that Anna Stutzman was the woman who'd mothered her. Moira continued, that's why you don't see her around too often. She just likes to be alone, but she would help with the baby if I needed her to. Selma paused, looking at her friend in a different light. Right in that very moment, she finally understood everything so much clearer. But why hadn't Moira ever explained that to her before? She looked down and sighed. I'm sorry. I didn't know, she said. I didn't know how special Anna was to you. How could you know? There's no way you could have, Moira replied. But that's just why my sister and I are so close to Mr. Stutzman and his family. The two families were as close as two families could ever be. I do want to see Michael happy. I just didn't want him to forget Anna in the process. I think it is fairly safe to say that such a thing would never happen, Selma insisted. Just because his heart might yearn to feel love once more doesn't mean it will ever forget its first love. Mrs. Stutzman will always be in his heart, even if he marries again. I guess that's not much of a concern anymore, is it? She said, sobbing once more, this time into the palms of her hands. Moira placed her hand on Selma's shoulder and patted it gently. I hate to see you sad, Selma. I think you're letting what Michael said get to you much more than it should. Give him some time to get better, and to see that his life doesn't have to be over just yet. I honestly believe that he will come around, and if you're already back in Colson County when he does, it might be too late, she said. You must stay. Slowly pulling her hands from her face, Selma looked at Moira and smiled as best she could. Thank you for the kind words, but maybe it's already too late. I tried to argue with him, and I told him that I didn't want to leave, but he was adamant. What if I was to stay and it did nothing but upset him? I really don't believe it would, Moira said. You're here to help me with this little bundle of joy. Moira rubbed her belly. He's not the kind of man to put himself before others, even when he's scared for his life. I suppose you're right. Perhaps I could wait a little longer to make such a final decision, Selma said. But I'm worried. I don't want to hold on to a slither of hope if none truly exists. I can assure you that he doesn't really want you to leave. In his mind, saving you from himself might be the only way he knows to avoid causing you unhappiness. He's truly selfless. He doesn't know that you love him so much that you want to look after him. Selma lounged back on the sofa and sighed, staring off into the distance. She wondered what to do, but her heart had already made up its mind for the most part. 
After getting lost in a barrage of thoughts and emotions, she sat back up and turned to Moira. I think you're right, she said. Moira smiled and looked at her, seemingly glad to hear that admission. I think so too, she replied. So, does that mean you're going to stay? Shaking her head, Selma sighed and closed her eyes. I think it means that I should go back home until things have changed. If your mother helps you throughout the remainder of your pregnancy, then I'm not really needed here. Moira frowned as she stared at Selma. But you said that you thought that what I said was right? You are right. Mr. Stutzman will feel better in time and maybe then his mind will have changed. Even if not, however, I'm sure you'll need me much more then than you do now. Perhaps if I take his advice and leave, but come back when your baby is finally born things could be better. And if they aren't, then I'll stay for you, Tom and the little one," Selma explained. Besides, I should go and check on those cats that Jeremiah is looking after. Moira nodded and smiled, rubbing at her eyes. If that's what you want to do then. My mother will try her best, but like I said earlier, she's always had a hard time with children, even her own. My sisters would both be more than happy to help, but they're both so busy and probably wouldn't be able to help out much. Well, you don't have to worry about any of that. I'll certainly come back to help you, but I just think I need to get away for a while. Seeing Michael in that hospital bed every day has been very challenging, and after showing up every day despite that, he still wants to cast me away. I've got feelings too, you know. I know, but sometimes people can only see their own view of the world, especially when they're unwell. I think this is the only way that a relationship could ever work. He clearly needs to be alone right now, and it probably wouldn't hurt me either. If I can't give him this, how good of a woman can I really be? Selma asked. You're a great woman. And I am dreadfully sorry that I wasn't happy about the two of you at first, Moira said. However, you are making a lot of sense. Honor his wishes, come back when Tom and I need you, and then perhaps God will be ready to place the two of you together. Maybe, Selma said biting her lip. I still don't want to see you leave, but if this might lead to your happiness and Michael's later on, then that will be good. Just make sure you come back to us. Chapter 10 One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Psalm chapter 27 verse 4 I suppose I should go pack my belongings, Selma said, wiping away another tear from her cheek. Moira frowned, shook her head and looked down almost as if in shame. I wish you would stay, but whatever you think is best, she replied, looking back up at her friend with a forced smile. Even Moira couldn't give her advice, but Selma didn't think that there were any other viable options other than returning to Colson County. She had to just leave everything up to fate. If she and Michael were meant to be together, she wanted with all her heart to believe that it would happen despite how bleak the future looked right then. Selma nodded to Moira and then turned away to head to her bedroom. Even though she didn't own much in the way of material possessions, it was going to be a long night of packing and preparing for her. The trip home probably wouldn't be very enjoyable either, she thought. As she walked down the long hallway toward the room, she heard what sounded like footsteps behind her. The startling noise caused her head to spin around, but as she turned to see who was following her she stumbled backward and the fear and confusion engulfed her. When she regained her composure she looked and saw that it was just Tom. I hope I didn't frighten you, he called out trying to catch her as she trembled. Oh, you didn't? I just, she replied, trying to make something up on the spot to avoid sounding rude. Tom laughed. I clearly did, he shot back. But I wasn't trying to catch up to you just to terrify you. I was hoping I could have a moment with you in private. Selma looked at him intently. What possible reason could he have for asking to talk to her in private? Hoping that it might be something important, she nodded and motioned for him to follow her. When they got to her bedroom, she opened the door and held it as he walked in. Closing it gently, she glanced up at him and tilted her head. So what was it you wanted to talk to me about? Tom walked over to the bed and sat down onto it. He patted the empty space on it beside him. Doing as he suggested, Selma sat on the bed and then waited anxiously to hear what he had to say. I listened into your conversation just then with Moira. It might not be my place to come in here and speak my mind, but for once I cannot just turn a blind eye and let things happen. 
I saw how Moira treated you ever since she found out about you and Michael. She's warming to the idea now, which is good, but even Michael's own children have been making you feel awful and for what reason? Just because you make someone they care about very happy. It makes no sense to me, he explained, shaking his head. Selma sighed and nodded, she understood everything he'd said. It's not a concept that I can really grasp, knowing that they want Michael to live the remainder of his life unhappy and alone. I hadn't known how or why Moira and her sisters became so close to the Stutzmans, but now that Moira explained it to me, it all makes a bit more sense. They don't want Michael to forget about Mrs. Stutzman, but I don't think they realize that he never will, she said. That's the stark truth, he replied. I'm sure you have heard a fair amount about Moira and me, right? I have, but what do you mean specifically? Selma asked, biting her lower lip as she searched her mind for what he meant. You met her when she became a school teacher over in Colson County and boarded with your sister, correct? Tom asked, a wide smile creasing his lips. Still confused, Selma slowly nodded. Yeah. Well, she was only there because of me. You see, since the day I met her, Moira has always been the love of my life. Things between us might seem strong and stable now, but not long ago I was in a similar place to the one which you are now finding yourself in. Selma lounged back on the bed and stared at him, not saying anything until she was sure what he meant. After several long moments of silence, she finally sat back up and sighed. Unless one of you almost died and pushed the other away, I'm not sure exactly how you were like me, she said in a cold, frank tone. She didn't mean to sound rude or inconsiderate, but it became more and more difficult to hold back her bitterness as frustration stirred in her chest. Tom shook his head and leaned closer to her, his eyes focused directly on hers. Moira only moved to Colson County because she thought she was doing me a favor. After I asked her to marry me the first time, she ran away from Earl Town in hopes that I would move on and forget about her. She gave some silly excuse why she couldn't marry me, and her reason made no sense at all. I knew that she loved me, but she moved away from me. Selma tilted her head and furrowed her brow. Wait, then how did you both end up back together? she asked. Selma remembered the young Moira she'd met long ago when she first moved in with Millie, Selma's sister. Moira was always so boisterous and full of life, as though nothing would get her down. The Moira that Selma knew now was one who was weighed down with concerns. It upset Selma that one of Moira's concerns was her, Selma, and Michael. Tom smiled and paused, closing his eyes for just a brief moment. We ended up together because I finally didn't let her push me away. I fought for what I desired, for what I loved. It took me a long time to get up the courage to find her and ask her to marry me once more, but I made the decision that I would, despite the fear and despite the odds. So you never gave up on her, even though she told you she wasn't interested? Selma asked. Tom nodded. That just about sums it up, he replied. I figured she had two options, she would either say no for the final time, or she would admit that she still loved me and that she wanted to come back home. Luckily, when I showed up one day and told her that I wasn't leaving without her, she broke down and explained in detail why she had run away and what scared her so much. From there things between us grew stronger. Now I can't imagine what life would be like if I hadn't had the courage to face her and stand my ground, he explained. Selma stood up and walked over to the window. She looked up at the setting sun as orange and red hues lit up the skyline. In that moment her conversation with Tom fell from her mind as she thought about how things were going back home in Colson County. It had been quite a while since she had been home, but her nephew had written to her recently. He informed her that the cats were doing well and that everything else was okay. He also mentioned that he was fine looking after everything and she should stay there as long as she wished. Have you decided for certain that you'll go back? Tom asked, pulling her attention back to reality. Selma turned away from the window and looked at him. His eyes seemed to be studying her carefully, waiting for her reply. I haven't made it official, but I don't see any other choice. You always have a choice, Tom replied, standing up from the bed as well. Let me ask you this, however. Has Mr. Stutzman ever discussed marriage with you? Well, we spoke about it a few times, but he never actually asked outright in so many words. It was understood that marriage would be in our future, but when the time was right. I think that he was just as worried about how his boys, Moira and her sisters would feel about the announcement as I was, so we held on to the agreement that it would happen when the time was perfect. I guess that will be never. Selma sighed. 
Tom walked closer to her and shook his head. Never say never, he quipped. When Moira first moved away, I fell into a deep pit of despair and self-loathing. I tried to move on with my life, but with half of it missing, I just couldn't do it. Every time I tried to make contact with her, she ignored me and never responded. She thought that putting me out of her mind would somehow cure us both. Instead, all it did was instill a feeling of emptiness in both her and I. We had become two halves rather than the whole that we should have been. Selma stared at Tom and wondered what point he was trying to make. Chapter 11 A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. That ye also love one another. John chapter 13 verse 33 As Selma talked more with Tom, she pursed her lips into a pout and looked down wondering if she and Michael would ever be a married couple. She already felt empty without even leaving town. The thought of traveling miles from the man she loved was becoming all the more terrifying. She looked at Tom, and was grateful that he was sharing such intimate things with her. So, how exactly did Moira realize that you were both meant to be together? It seems her leaving was enough to make you realize it, but what about Moira? Selma asked. I didn't leave her much of a choice. One day I was out working on my family's farm when something hit me. It was a strange feeling, like a warning that I was running out of time. Then Moira's beautiful face flashed into my mind, and I knew at once what I had to do. I knew in my heart that she loved me, and I had to make her see that I was what she needed. Tom chuckled. I needed to prove to her that we were supposed to be together. I went to Colson County and told her that I wasn't leaving without her. Selma's mouth twitched. So Moira agreed to marry you just because you drove a couple days to see her? Tom laughed and shook his head. No, she agreed to marry me because, for the first time, she knew that we were truly meant for each other. All that time apart was for nothing, we needed to be together, and that moment is what made her realize it too. That's all you have to do, Selma. Show Michael Stutzman that God has brought you both together, and that nothing will stop your desire to be with him. Just let him know that until he can look you in the face and honestly admit that he no longer loves you, there's nowhere else for you to be but by his side. Trust me, no man will ever do that unless he truly means it, he insisted. Selma ventured back over to the bed and sat down. Looking up at Tom, she gave a lopsided smile. So, does that mean you think I should tell him that I'm not going anywhere? Exactly. I have heard that he's home now. He is? Selma asked. Tom clapped his hands together and nodded. He walked toward the door and gave her a little bow before he left the room. Selma smiled at his antics and then lay back on the bed to stare at the ceiling. Perhaps Tom was right. If Michael saw how much he meant to her, he would realize that life wasn't over just yet. They were meant to be together, she knew it now, but he didn't, not yet. That was the moment when she made up her mind to let Mr. Stutzman know that she wasn't going anywhere. Selma jumped up from her bed and went to find Tom. She found him in the living room. Tom, could I borrow one of your buggies? Of course you can, any time you wish. Would you happen to be going to see Mr. Stutzman? Selma looked at the cheeky grin on Tom's face. That's exactly where I'm going. I'm taking your advice. Tom stood and stretched his arms over his head. At last someone's listening to me. I'll hitch the buggy for you. Selma followed Tom out to the barn. She watched on while he prepared the buggy and the bay gelding. There you go, Selma. Drive safely. Thank you, Tom. Your words were helpful to me. Tom smiled. Don't rush back, take your time. Selma climbed into the buggy and flapped the reins against the side of the gelding telling him to move onward. All the way to see Mr. Stutzman, she was worried about what Moira might think about the two of them, should she be able to talk Mr. Stutzman around. Moira seemed okay about it now, but was that only because she thought that Selma was going back to Colson County? Then there were Mr. Stutzman's boys and his daughter-in-laws. Selma bit her lip as she imagined their sour faces at the news that she and Mr. Stutzman would marry. Then Selma realized that before she faced any opposition, she had to make Mr. Stutzman see that they had to be together. They made each other happy, and it was what they both wanted. Surely he thought he was doing the right thing in sending her away, but she wanted to look after him even if he became an invalid. She had to convince him that she wanted to be with him, no matter what their future held. 
She wondered who would be looking after Michael now that he was at home. When she got to the Stutzman house, she climbed down from the buggy and walked to the front door. Before she could knock, the door flew open to reveal Mrs. Suddy, a widow from the Amish community. Hello Selma, nice to see you again. Selma noticed that Ida Suddy planted herself in the doorway, and she didn't look like she was going to step aside to let her through. Hello Ida. What are you doing here? I didn't know that you knew the Stutzmans that well. They called on me to care for Mr. Stutzman for a few days while he gets stronger. Good, wonderful. She stared at the woman and Ida stared back at her. Mind if I come in? Selma eventually asked after Ida didn't offer. There's no one here but Michael and he's tired. He's resting right now. Well, he's expecting me. He asked for me to come. Ida frowned and her thin mouth turned down at the corners. You'll have to come back later then. I'll tell him you called. Ida went to shut the door, but Selma lunged forward and placed her black boot in the doorway. Ida looked up at her with her mouth open. What are you doing, Selma? Selma leaned forward so Ida had no choice but to step back. I said I'm here to see Mr. Stutzman. Ida gasped as Selma pushed her way through the door. Who's there? Mr. Stutzman called from upstairs. It's me, Michael. I'll be up in a minute. Ida grabbed hold of Selma's arm and hissed in a quiet voice, You think you can bustle your way through and take the only man my age in the community? Why don't you find someone from your own community? It's just not right. I've been waiting for him for some time. We've got an understanding, he and I. Selma pulled her arm away. Well, I don't know about that. Selma headed briskly toward the stairs. Come up now please Selma, Mr. Stutzman called. I'm coming, Selma yelled back. When Selma pushed Mr. Stutzman's bedroom door open she saw that his arms were extended toward her. You've come back to me, he said. Yeah, I have. She hugged him as best she could. We belong together. They left me here with Ida. I think she's planning our wedding. She should be planning my funeral. Hush, Michael. I'll hear no such thing. I've come to tell you that I'm not leaving you, and I don't care if we only have one day, one week or one year together. It doesn't matter to me if I have to look after you as though you were a baby. I need to be with you, Michael Stutzman. Michael laughed. I'm glad you've come, I prayed you'd come back to me. I changed my mind about telling you to leave as soon as you walked out my door. I realized that we should make the most of the time on this earth that God has given us. Yeah, that makes sense to me, Selma said. As soon as I got stronger and got rid of that terrible woman from my house, I was coming to fetch you. They looked into each other's eyes. Say you'll marry me, Selma. I will, I will marry you, Michael Stutzman. Just try and stop me. Two weeks later, Michael was strong enough to call a family meeting which included Moira and Tom. Mr. Stutzman started off by saying, I've called you all here today to tell you that I've asked this lovely woman beside me to marry me. What did she say? Adam, his oldest son, asked. I said yes, Selma answered. Despite Selma and Michael's fears, Michael's sons and daughter-in-laws took the news well. They'd grown used to the idea of their father being fond of another woman. I don't want to take your mother's place, Selma said. I know that I could never do that. What I do want is to look after your vatter the best that I can. Well, I think that's fine. How can we be unhappy about that? Adam said. Welcome to the family, Miriam, Moira's oldest sister, said. Moira stood up. I must say something. I was against the idea of you two being together. I loved Anna so much, and it seemed odd to think that Michael felt fondness for someone else, but I'm glad now. I'm happy that you two can make each other happy. I couldn't imagine being on my own again without my Tom. Moira looked lovingly at her husband, and then she doubled over and clutched at her stomach. I think the baby might be coming now. Right on time, Tom said as he sprang to his feet. No, it's one week early, Miriam, Moira's oldest sister, said. You'll have to stay and have the baby here. Tom said, you'll have to have the baby here, it might not be safe to travel. I think you're giving birth tonight. Everyone gave a chuckle at Tom's excitement. Miriam fixed a room up for Moira to give birth in, and then gathered fresh towels. Miriam had experience in delivering babies, 
having delivered Hazel's two babies and many other babies in the community. Miriam was the closest the community had to a midwife. With Moira in the upstairs room, the family carried on with the dinner. When the dinner came to an end, Miriam, as the oldest daughter-in-law, sent everyone except Selma, Tom, and Moira home. Young Millie was already asleep in one of the bedrooms. Five hours later, baby William was born. When the excitement died down and everyone went to sleep, Selma went into the kitchen and made herself some tea. She heard a sound in the doorway and looked up to see that Michael was now awake, he'd slept through the whole thing. Moira had a boy, Selma said. That's wonderful news. It feels good that another child was born in this house. He sat down next to Selma. All went well, I trust? Yeah, it did. I'm too excited, and also too exhausted to sleep. Michael's gaze turned to the window of the kitchen. It's close to morning. How are you feeling? Selma asked. Feeling like I want to marry you. Selma. Will you marry me, and marry me as soon as possible? Selma gave a little giggle. I've already said I will marry you. I like to keep asking you. Michael chuckled. I'm a silly old man sometimes. I do feel better about things after the meal last night. Your family is more accepting than I thought they'd be. Adam even apologized for being rude. Forget them, Selma. They'll be fine, they're all adults now anyway. Yeah, I will marry you, Michael Stutzman. Michael leaned toward her and kissed her on her forehead. You've made me a contented man, Selma. I have something to live for again. Michael Stutzman and Selma were married twelve weeks later. After the wedding ceremony, the food was served and Moira managed to pull Selma aside. Selma, I'm so sorry that I was horrid to you when you and Michael were first courting. You were never that way with me, Moira. I had awful thoughts. I thought that in some way that Anna Stutzman would be forgotten, or somehow you marrying Michael made Anna's memory a little more distant or something. I know you thought that. You've already told me that you felt that way and I understand. How do you feel now then? Selma asked. I'm so happy for both of you. I can't think of anything that I'd like better than two of my favorite people getting married. Selma put her arm around Moira's shoulders. Thank you for saying that. I'm glad that we've got everyone's approval now. Everything has turned out the way that I hoped it would. Although, sometimes I get a few strange looks from some of Michael's boys, but I guess that's understandable. What are you two chattering about? Moira turned around to see Michael walking toward her and Selma. I was telling Selma how I felt when the two of you first started to get interested in one another. Moira put her hand to her mouth and gave an embarrassed laugh. Changes take a while to get used to, Michael said. Like all these cats that I'm now the vatter of. Moira giggled at the thought of Mr. Stutzman having a house full of cats. I'm happy for both of you. I really am. Thank you, Moira, that means a great deal to both of us. You and your sisters are very special to both of us. Michael looked lovingly at his new wife. Come on, Selma. People are waiting for us to take our seats at the wedding table. Moira watched as Michael took hold of Selma's hand. She saw the elderly couple smile at each other before they walked back to their wedding guests arm in arm. While the earth remaineth. Seed time and harvest. And cold and heat and summer and winter. And day and night shall not cease. Genesis chapter 8 verse 22. Thank you for listening to Amish Second Loves. The next book in the Amish Bride series is Book 5 Amish Silence.